Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome audience to another episode of the Talking Theme podcast. I'm your host Majid and today I have with me Rash and uh, brother JK. Salam brothers, how's it going? Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, not too bad. Alhamdulillah, how are you guys? Yeah, not too bad. I think uh, it's, it's 2020, man. 2020 is going to go down in history. It's just been, it's like it's never ending here. You know what I mean? It's like normally every year, every year goes, goes fast, especially when you're getting a bit older. But it just seems like 2020 is sticking around, man. And, you know, with all the stuff uh, kicking off with the elections in America, um, mm. you know, you, you expect uh, to turn on the phone in the morning thinking they may have declared who's won it. But the, uh, the circus continues. It's quite strange, isn't it? They, they go on about advocating democracy and all of these things, but actually what you're hearing is people on the ground and how frustrated they are and, you know, wanting to hear a result. People who, you know, obviously from the Trump side, it sounds like they're going to lose and people aren't going to be very happy about it. Mm. People even talking about coming out onto the street, streets with guns. So mm. yeah. it makes you think they always criticise Muslim countries and how how the elections and things that are carried out there, but look at what's happening in America itself. And this is what they want to export into our lands at the end of the day. That's the thing, yeah. at least it shows, shows up the system, shows up the fact that it's not this kind of pure, perfect system that they claim it to be. In fact, it's got a lot of flaws. A lot of people will be against it. I think there's about 30% of people that didn't even vote who were eligible. So it shows that there isn't this, uh, you know, great confidence in the system. Uh, there is uh, there's a lot of uh, people that are a bit sceptical about the whole election in, in America, who's meant to be the, the land of the free and the main uh, kind of uh, pr promoters of this system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and that's the thing. What it does show really is uh, that, I mean, the mandate, for example, I think they're saying Joe Biden's broken records in, in regards to how many votes he's actually had. But if people know the American electoral system, they'll know that it doesn't always boil down to the one who gets the most most votes. It's to do with the electoral college, yeah. um, and and may, maybe the maybe you know the the deep state is sitting somewhere in a smoky room smoking cigars, you know weighing up the pros and cons of shall we let Trump have another term? Shall we bring in Smokey Joe? Um, yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's because the, the reality is is it doesn't really boil down to the people and i think that's that's an uh, illusion for the for the masses to think that they've played their part but reality is is that you know the ones with real power uh, they are the decision makers and, and not your not your normal you know uh, person off the street well one thing that's uh, quite promising or a good thing for us really is trump is uh, really showing up the democratic system he's, he's calling out the deep state he's calling out the fraud that could be happening and um, that isn't good for the system, but I was saying it to some brothers the other, uh, a bit ago that uh, it shows that he's a true capitalist, that he, he is willing to put democracy and secularism under the bus to maintain power, because he's, he is the true capitalist, isn't he? Uh, so just to maintain that position, that power, that being the president of the US, uh, he's willing to just do all of that. And, uh, and most people wouldn't. Most people would just put their hands up and say, look, uh, I accept if he, democracy won. But he isn't, which is it's good. Really, it kind of shows it up, which which is positive, I think. Yeah, I yeah. think. Uh, sorry, Rush, did you want to say something? No, no, I was just going to say. To be fair, there's lots of different angles that you can take. Today's podcast, we're not necessarily going to speak about <laughs> that, but, but it, it, there is lots of different angles. You know, people are saying there's probably been the highest voter turnout, you know, ever or something like that in the seventy, nearly yeah. seventy percent. So some people will argue that shows how democracy is effective over it's there but anybody who kind of scratches below the surface they will realize that it's just an illusion it makes you think you've got a say because you put a bot you know a, a, a ballot something into the ballot box once every four years suddenly you know you're influencing what is happening either internally or you know on foreign policy but actually you're not you know it's the ones that are the decision makers as you guys have already said are going to do what they're going to do and every now and again, they'll have to try and pull a manoeuvre just to please you, just to get your vote the next time. But even then, they'll probably, you know, facilitate some kind of a terrorist attack. And then all of the support will go back towards someone. So we, we know a lot of it is just like a bit of a, 
a game and the people are are the pawns that are used in that game unfortunately yeah no definitely and uh i think the the important point you make there is that this isn't today's topic but it probably should have been but i mean what we want to speak about today really uh it's actually following on from a podcast we did a couple of weeks no, no actually about a month ago yeah. on uh on france in the, the comments in regards to um, macron's comments about uh you know islam being in crisis the issue to do with uh, the cartoons being uh you know uh shown about well they claim it's our beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam but we obviously we know it isn't but nevertheless they're trying to insult islam and insult the prophet in that way and we had a discussion on this but since then a lot's happened you know um we've had this uh, the execution of uh, a teacher um and that actually you know led to a beheading actually mm-hmm. and that led to uh, a situation where the french were actually um, projecting these cartoons these uh, you know uh, filthy images onto state buildings and and since then we've even seen an attack in nice and also we've seen um, attacks in vienna but we'll, we'll we'll discuss that but what we want to speak about today really is because um the response from the muslims mainly was to do with boycotting okay so what we saw is we saw muslims you know around the muslim world and even in the west to a certain degree you know they said actually you know what let's let's boycott the french products and then you had leaders like uh, president erdogan you know he even came out and he actually you know he he was calling on the turkish people to do the same right now what we've seen is since then um there's a couple of couple of comments that uh, macron's made which suggests that before he was very gung ho but there's a few things he said which suggests that he's maybe softening his stance okay um and as an example there's a, there's an al jazeera interview he did and and you got to understand that for him to do an interview al jazeera for our for the arabic audience mainly right and basically in this uh, quoting him he said you know i understand the sentiments being expressed and i respect them i.e. that the muslims were angry in regards to his cartoons i think that the reactions came as a result of lies and distortions of my words because people understood that i supported these cartoons right and then he said the character the caricatures are not a government governmental project but emerge from free and independent newspapers that are not affiliated with any gov- with the government and to be honest with you that that's bogus anyway because the fact that they were projecting these on government state buildings right is suggest that the governments were doing it but also there was a uh, france uh, they've been looking to appoint like a special envoy uh, to send to the muslim lands to discuss uh, macron's views on secularism and, and and freedom of expression and mainly this is to quell the backlash that uh, the the world has seen the french have seen from the muslim world right now what i wanted to start off discussing really is the fact that uh, do you think that uh, this softening of of a stance in a way um from macron and from the french okay even though i just want to i do want to add an important point that the message that macron gives to the french people is different to the message he gives to the muslim world right but nevertheless you see the a softening of a stance do would this uh, do you think that the uh, this shows that the the boycotting the boycotting of french goods is actually working i think let's start off on discussing this question first yeah i think uh, the first thing really is that the fact that the muslims are uniting uh, together uh, and and boycotting and even these mass protests that we're seeing across the world uh, predominantly in bangladesh and pakistan uh, really demonstrates which is a real, you know it's positive it demonstrates that the ummah has this collective love and emotion for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this in itself is is a positive this is uh, something that uh, we should be praiseworthy but um i think what it's not just the cartoon so like you said uh, this came from the backdrop of uh, macron saying islam is in crisis that there's a problem of islamic separatism in in france Uh, and and islamism so then the cartoons came you know as you said following that attack so it really shows that the umma isn't just against the cartoons yes that's the trigger point but also against uh, the the very values that allowed the cartoons to be displayed on the buildings which is freedom of expression uh, 
So that's that's a positive, and I think we have to uh, recognise that first before asking the question whether the boycott is working. It, because from a Muslim perspective, from an Islamic perspective, yes, it's bringing the Muslims together. So if, if this one thing brings the Muslims together, I would view that as a positive. But just to go to your question about uh, whether you know Macron, uh, you know Macron, the fact that he's backtracking a little bit, he went on Al Jazeera. I don't know whether you know, he also uh, he sent some tweets in Arabic. Uh, in, uh, so on his Twitter account, there's an Arabic language saying that, you know, we, we along the lines of uh, we respect people's opinions, we, we kind of understand the Muslims' anger. Uh, however, and he always caveated it with the fact that we still respect our right to freedom of expression. So he didn't fully backtrack on, a val on the values. I think what he's backtracked on is um, the, the reaction that it caused and maybe the extent they went to. Uh, he just wants to kind of soften that slightly. Um, but I'm, I've been looking at this boycott thing uh, and whether it has worked or if, whether it's had an impact. And I think for me, there's two ways of looking at it. One is uh, the whole purpose of a boycott is usually economic. Can we have, can uh, people come together, boycott a certain thing and cause an economic impact? So there's a financial impact on the French economy. That's one thing. And if you look at it, I think we have to be honest with ourselves. Has it caused the economy, French economy to, to crash? Not yet, and I don't think there's enough evidence of that. However, the capitalist system, the way it works is uh, the stock market is not necessarily based on demand. It's based on confidence. So now if there's uh, enough voices around the world to say boycott French products, boycott French companies, actually what that may do is investors will lose confidence in their investments. And they may, even if nothing's happened, they may start to sell off their, uh, you know, French investment, and this could cause a crash. So there is a likelihood, and that's probably why the French have come out uh, and said, "Look, Muslim countries, the Middle East, they need to stop with these calls for boycotting." And and, and particularly, he's come out against Erdogan because he said it himself that the people should boycott French products. So he's come out against that, and obviously, we know there's a bit of history. Um, and the, the thing I looked into a bit more, just from an economic perspective, I wanted to understand, is there a possibility to have a financial impact on the French economy? And if you look at the, uh, the main thing is exports, right? So French exports is what people will be buying. But if you look at uh, this uh, different, the, the, the kind of the categorization of their exports, what, if I asked you guys, both of you, what is the products that we're boycotting? What are they? French products, what, what, are, what are the people boycotting? Heavy and water. Water, um, dairy products, cheese, yogurt. Beauty and maybe products like L'Oreal and stuff like that are quite yeah. popular. Yeah. yeah, so these are the commercial products that people will be boycotting, right? But when I looked into the percentage of exports that this makes up, it's not even 5%. It's not, it's not a lot. And if you take that 5% now, because that 5% is the whole world's exports, right? Then you look at how many Muslim countries France mm. exports to, it's like 1%. So that 5% now really dwindles into something really insignificant in the millions, if, if we assume everyone boycotted, right? Yeah. Um, and if you think about French cars, that isn't a product that's uh, like, you don't, that's not a daily purchase, that's going to be a, the cars are long-term purchases, right? So the boycott needs to last for a while to have an impact on that sector. So anyway, my, the point I'm making is that if we're, if we're looking at this impact from an economic or financial impact, I would argue it's going to be very difficult to have an impact. And their business needs have come out and said, it's not really going to affect us. Muslim countries don't make that much of our exports. But the, the, I think the more important impact that I think Mahron is worried about and the French are worried about is the fact that it's unifying the Muslims and causing a reputation for the French. So before this boycott, if I said to you, boycott, and I, we spoke about boycott, who do we think of? Naturally. When we think of boycott, what country? Israel. Israel. Israel, right? But Israel, as, as much as they support them, the West support Israel, Israel doesn't have a great reputation. They have the reputation of being usurpers, you know, an occupation, uh, as, as the evil ones. And the French don't want this reputation. They want to be known as the, uh, the leaders of secularism, but not from a negative evil perspective, but from a perspective of this is the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah, and they, they don't want that reputation. Yeah. 
from an enlightenment point of view, liberalism point of view, they all see those as positive values that the exactly. French Republic is known for. Absolutely. And that, that's my point. I think the question you asked about whether it's having an impact, I think it is, but not necessarily economic. I think the impact is more reputational. I think the impact could be it's Fran the, you know, France's standing in the world. So, you know, from an economic point of view, is there a difference between uh, people boycotting as like, you know, your person is not going to go and get L'Oreal or, or whatever, right? Rather than yeah. states. Because, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the other sectors which, are the, which make the main sectors of the exports from the French. Uh, surely those exports are going to be on a state level, right? Yeah, so yeah, if yeah. states were boycotting, then that would have a different impact. Would that be correct? Yeah. That's absolutely correct. Yeah, I was meant to say actually that when it comes to looking at the top exports for France, they are in the machinery, nuclear reactors, boilers, like it's, it's the state exports that go out to uh, major countries. It's not your commercial products. It's not your, your L'Oreal or your, your perfume or whatever you may use. This is like your military hardware. So if for the likes of you know, Turkey or these major nations that do export from France, now decided to stop purchasing products from uh, France, and, and it also includes that aircrafts and so, you know craft uh, ships and things like this for the for the naval force. So if the states decided now, from a state level, we're going to stop purchasing from France and move to somewhere else, this is where it will have a sizable impact on the French economy, and actually it could lead to a crash in the French economy altogether. So mm. when Erdogan made these comments about the French should, uh, the, the people should boycott France. I think this worried France a lot because now if he's encouraging the people to boycott, if now he as a state boycotts and, and Pakistan follow and other nations follow, then the French are, are um, in trouble. And this is compelled with COVID. COVID-19 has already uh, you know, slowed down Western economy, all, all economies across the world. There's already this fear that the, the world is going to go into another recession, right? Mm -hmm. So in a, in a world where it's, you know, boom and economy, there's not a lot of economic activity, a boycott may not have an impact. But if in a world where you're looking for every penny, any level of boycott, even if it's a small impact, could crash the whole economy. And the, the West and the French won't want this. So you're absolutely the, right. The reason why I ask as well is because you know, like, you've had the BDS movement being yeah. going on for ages. You know, it hasn't really achieved you know anything really. In fact, the no. you know if you look at the situation of the of Palestine when the BDS movement began to now, it's far worse. So yeah. uh, so that's the reason why I asked that question because you know people might be boycotting, and Alhamdulillah, like you said, they're doing this out of their love for the Dean, their love for the Messenger, and also their hatred for those who try to insult and try to mock our Dean, right? Yeah. But it could well be that, you know, I'm not saying it's an illusion because certainly there's something there, but yeah. certainly that desired result um, probably won't be there. And, and that's what sort of leads me to my, my sort of second question that I think is worth discussing. You know, the stats that you've provided, I don't think a lot of people know that. And myself, I didn't really know all those stats. So, so you do think that actually the Muslims are calling for boycotts, uh, a boycott. And hey, look, France is trying to tone down a little, right? It's working. And uh, I think the point you make is an important one of a reputational point of view. Probably not just purely economical, whether it's in the stocks or whether I think Rash sort of alluded to it to do with France as, as a country in the system they adopt. So do you think that, you know, the, the, the softening of the stance, maybe, yeah, the boycott might have something to do with it. But at the same time, the fact that, Macron or the French are uh, having to try to explain what secularism is and explain what they mean by this sort of stuff. That, in fact, um, it's more to do with that secularism, uh, French secularism is being tarnished. And, it's, and even those uh, sec so called secularists in the Muslim world that you know, are trying to corrupt Muslims. You know, it's even making their job more difficult, right? So maybe this suffering of the stance or the need for them to explain themselves is more on an ideological level than purely economical. Yeah, so let me come in there. You know, the boycotting thing was presented to the Ummah, to the Muslims, as this way of, you know, this Islam is being attacked, more even 
more kind of sensitively the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being attacked. Here is a way which you can show solidarity. Here is a way where you can put up a front, a united front against mm. an attack on the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Ummah at large saw that and thought, you know, yes, we do need to do something to show that we care because they do clearly. And the boycotting was almost a, an easy way to say, look, you know, if we boycott and to add to boycotting, protesting comes into that as well. Yeah? yeah. So you saw protests, you saw boycotts. So that was a way for the Muslims and for ourselves to say, you know, look, we're doing something in order to show our unity against what, friend, the, um, what France are doing. Yeah. And what France are portraying. Um, and the positive side of that definitely is Muslims recognize from an Aqidah point of view, they're united on this very important issue of the Prophet and an attack on Islam. That is very positive. And for Muslims to feel emotional about that, that's also very positive because the initial anger has to be, it tends to be emotional. And then once the emotions are agitated, then we start to think, okay, you know, now what do we need to do from an intellectual point of view or what do we need from an action point of view to solve this problem? Um, yeah. So the, the issue almost arose that rather than really looking at the objectives of the boycott, it was more about, look, let's have this level of solidarity. Okay, yeah. um, because really, as JK said, did someone really sit down and say, will this achieve the objectives that we want? Okay, probably not. Um, no, probably probably not. not. Okay, so however, that's not to undermine the efforts because that shows that Muslims want to do something and Muslims can be united on important matters. Mm. That's very important, yeah. Um, and then, even just to add a couple of little things, even JK saying, like the French um, are very um, reliant on tourism. I think France or Paris mm. is one of the most visited. Um, cities and countries in the world okay yeah. so covid has actually affected them economically quite significantly so mm. if you add this layer to the covid layer it probably did concern them slightly okay yeah definitely. Um, so that's why i think this whole issue they have had to soften their stance a little bit um, but furthermore in answer to your question maj in terms of another reason for softening is i don't think and you guys may disagree, some of the other European nations are even that pleased that um, Muslims are now coming out and calling out secularism. Yeah. Because if you make that clash of civilizations between Islam and secularism, if you put that out in the, you know, the public domain to be debated intellectually, mm. we as Muslims know that when you have an intellectual discussion with us and you present Islam intellectually and someone else presents secularism intellectually, we know secularism was born out of a compromise. We know secularism um, ha is deeply flawed as an ideology. We're now witnessing how democracy, which comes from secularism, how deeply flawed it is. So I think this other softening of the stance is to do with the fact that do, they don't want secularism to be put out there as something to be attacked in the way that you know, a lot of people are now calling out the hypocrisy. So as a couple yeah. of little examples is France came out and said, you can't attack our flag. There's going to be a 1500 euro fine if you do so. When there was that image of that that guy wiping his backside with the French flag. I yeah? see that. <laughs> so, and then there's there's already rules about Holocaust denial. There's mm. already rules about not mentioning the Armenian genocide. So all yeah. of a sudden, the Ummah and non-Muslims as well, by the way, have come out saying, wait there, your values are hypocritical. Mm. And that exposes secularism. And I think that is probably a bigger issue to them than the boycott. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think the other example, which is absurd, really, is Macron coming out on Twitter and saying uh, secularism has killed, n never killed anyone. Like, okay, it's an absurd claim, and it can absolutely be. I don't know why he said it because it's so clearly untrue. And we, I, mean, I think, in, on both of you, we actually exposed this and showed how 
the French have committed many atrocities in the name of secularism, as well as other nations. But the point here is that, why is he saying that? The reason he's saying is that he's trying to defend secularism now. He's trying to say that secularism, or les cites, or whatever they call it, um, is pure and is good and it hasn't killed anyone, which is entirely untrue. But it's, it's come to bite him back, bite him back to be fair. I don't, I don't think he should have made that claim because even, like you said, non-Muslims called him out for that. Mm. That's yeah, not true. I think, also, I think what it is, is I think what Rush makes a really good point that uh, even other nations or other leaders or other secularists, they're not comfortable with this with discussion. And, 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 and to be honest with you, Maybe, I mean, another question is that, you know, people, obviously the French, they promote themselves as being, you know, the France is the place where secularism was, was born um, from their point of view, right? Yeah. So they, they feel like, you know, they have ownership of it to a certain degree. So, you know, secularism, so that's the, that's the real secularism and everything else is a bidder, right? Because what you're seeing, <laughs> you're seeing a lot of bidders and, and there, was a bit, there was even a bit of beef or a bit of issue between... Um, Macron and Trudeau of, of Canada, yeah. for example, uh, because after all this stuff that happened, Trudeau, he, he made some, uh, some, some comments which were criticized actually in Canada or in, and France as well. And what he said was that about the cartoons, he said, freedom of expression is not without limits. We owe, to our, we owe it to ourselves to act with respect for others and to seek not to arbitrarily or unnecessarily injure those with whom we are sharing a society and a planet. And he also said, we do, not have the right, we do not have the right, for example, to shout fire in a movie theater crowded with people. There are always limits. So, yeah. I mean, what he's saying is right in, from, from the point of, because a lot of people, maybe he's uh, addressing this to those people who are, who are, that Rush mentioned, like, who are saying, actually, this is hypocritical. Mm. You, you, mm. You, you say everything is open to, to be criticized, but then you can't criticize Holocaust, you can't criticize this issue like Rush meant about Armenia or the yeah. flag, right? So what he's saying is that, look, in reality, freedom, freedom is not without limits. But mm. that itself probably is not the true secularism. It seems like that's one of the sects of secularism, right? Because secularism is a religion, from my point of view, secularism is a religion, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that's why what we're seeing is that even though there's there's... Uh, an issue and I, f I feel that even the rest of the, the countries and, and the leaders like Rash pointed out they're not comfortable with secularism being attacked blatantly by the common person do, do you know yeah, yeah. funny as a quick point as well is that actually this also this is another reason from a western and a capitalist point of view they don't want this um, discussion to happen mainstream is because it also exposes their puppet regimes because what happens is if, for instance, Muslims in Bangladesh and Pakistan are revolting against this, if Muslims across the globe are boycotting and, speak, and calling out France, then all of a sudden, you know those puppet governments and leaders like your, the leaders of your Saudis and your leaders of your UAEs and stuff, if they then don't as well come out and attack mm. France or call out France on this, their, their legitimacy gets furthermore questioned by the masses we already know wow. that their agents and the puppets of 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 the west however when this discussion isn't happening in the mainstream then they can almost cover themselves with a cloak as soon as they now have to speak out they're having to speak out against their masters and no one's comfortable speaking out against their mm. master no no and, and the thing is even like erdogan coming out and saying stuff yeah, fair enough. I'm not saying he has he can do more. Definitely, I'm not saying he's done enough or sufficient amount. But the fact that he is calling out France, what it does is, like you said, it puts the other leaders in a difficult position because now the Muslim world has seen that some leaders can do it. Why can't others? And a clear example is Hasina, right, with the Bangladesh protests happening and the fact that there was whatever hundred thousand. I don't know how many people there were, but there were loads. Half they also. Half a million, wasn't there? So they were calling for her to now, um, what's the word? You know, you have uh, the French embassy and the French uh, ambassadors. No, send them back. back. Send yeah, them back, yeah. Put trade so, so, with France and get rid of yeah. the French embassy. 
Exactly, and that's these are political actions which the Ummah is demanding. So, if leaders and people don't do it now, or the or the representatives of the people supposedly are not following what the people are saying, that really shows them up. It exposes them. Mm. So, no, I, I agree. I think you can we can say that Muslims may need to do a bit more, and but actually, protests and boycotts is a, is a really good starting point. And my only kind of advice, and even to myself, is that. Let it not stop here. You know, we, we, we're calling this out, um, but you know, we will speak about. It, I'm sure, but they are trying to distract us with other events and things that are happening, and we just need to keep this burning, really, and make sure that we do yeah. take that correct action based on Islam. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think also uh, uh, what we're seeing um, is that, and this sort of adds up. It's not just a case that people are protesting or boycotting. It's you know, before it might have been a case where you're boycotting because of, uh, you know, when that Charlie Hebdo made that cartoon or that in Norway, yeah. right? You're, you're, what you're doing, I see this is different now because what you're doing there is those, at that time people were protesting against a newspaper. Mm -hmm. Here, Macron, he took it on the next level, he took it on a state level. So yeah. here you're seeing not just all Muslims attacking uh, France, Macron, but they're attacking the uh, the concept of freedom of expression mm -hmm. so what we've seen and, and and which is which is something i think actually is different from in the past when muslims are boycotted uh don't boycott so where they have uh, marched and demonstrated it's more to do with a particular action but i think mm -hmm. now it's become more because as, as jk mentioned at the beginning it's a good point it all started off when he mom when macron mentioned uh islam is in crisis muslims were like yo what are you talking about then you had the cartoons so this isn't just about cartoons, and, and what we're actually seeing is that even for on the uh, the West side, there may be issues where some leaders are pointing out, look, secularism comes with responsibility, or the French are saying, the reality is, is that these people are united on their, uh, back in their battle against Islam. So yeah. even when the attacks happened in Nice or Vienna recently, if you... And it's funny because this has something to do with the Turks or the or Erdogan because when he comes out, he does agitate them because, you know, there was a, uh, if you look at the statements made by the Europeans, for example, uh, I was going to read Coppola, right? So Macron, what did he say? He said, we, the French, share the shock and the grief of the Austrian people struck this evening by an attack in their heart of, in the heart of their capital, Vienna. After mm -hmm. France, it is a friendly country that is attacked. This is our Europe. You got you know, this is significant. This is our Europe. Our enemies must know who they are dealing with. We will not give up anything. And there was uh, the Giuseppe Conte, the uh, uh, not the football manager. This is the Italian prime minister. He said, "There is no room for hatred and violence in our common European home." Um, and also uh, Luigi Di Maio, Italian foreign minister. He said, "A cowardly attack, which we strongly condemn." Italy is close to the Austrian people, Europe must react. Now, what we're seeing here, to be honest with you, is Muslims historically, they have to understand the, the battle between Islam and Kufr, the battle between, between the Ottoman Khilafah and Europe. And, you know, it's clear that what we're seeing today, whether it's attack on the Messenger, وسلم, whether it's attack on Islam, this is a continuation in the war against Islam, right? And these comments about Europe and Europe and Europe and, and the issue with Turkey, these can't be taken out of context. These guys know that the battle that was going on before between the Ottomans and the, and the Europeans, okay, that battle may have ended, but the war, the actual war continues. And uh, just want to mention one last quote, was the Armenian Prime Minister, uh, Pashi, Pashinyan, if that's how you pronounce it. What he said was, uh, he said, Europe should wait for Turkey near Vienna if the international community does not intervene. People are thinking, Vienna, what's he talking about? <laughs> He's talking about the siege of Vienna in 1529 yeah. or the Battle of Vienna in 1683, when basically had Vienna fallen, on, uh, uh, had Vienna, Vienna, Vienna fallen to the Ottomans led by Suleiman the Magnificent, the Europeans up until today remember that Islam would have spread all throughout Central and Western Europe, okay? So what you, what we don't understand, we just see this as a one-off cartoon or, or this issue to do with, um, 
they're attacking uh, uh, Islam or they're saying Islam is crisis, we might, we might actually think of it uh, not in the greater picture. And the greater picture is that this is a continuation of this struggle. So, you know, I want to just add, because I mentioned the issue of, of Vienna, the, uh, not the siege of Vienna, the, the attack that happened in Vienna. And we've seen one in Nice and stuff like this. Now, do you think it's purely coincidental, right? Uh, that as soon as momentum started to uh, gain, uh, well, Muslim, the Muslim uh, boycott or the attack against secularism, as soon as it started to gain momentum in the Muslim lands, right? What we see is we see an attack in Nice. I think the Nice one was at a church. So it sort of linked it to the, these Muslims. They're not just against secularism. They're also against Islam as well, right? And then mm -hmm. we saw, you know, maybe the boycott quiet down a little and then we see the issue to do with what happened in Vienna. And what actually happens, for my opinion, and you might disagree, but the way I see it is for a moment in time, you had the secularists on the defensive. And for, and, and for a change, the Muslims were the victims, right? Even some non-Muslims are saying, look, why are you attacking their religion for? Why are you attacking their prophet for? You know, it's just agitating, right? So it seems like they were the trouble causers. But all of a sudden, two things quickly happened, two, two attacks. And all of a sudden, the Muslims and Islam are no longer the victims, but they're the perpetrators, right? Yeah. So do you think that these attacks that happen, do you think they're po uh, purely coincidental? Or is there a track record of the Europeans doing things like this from the in the past? Yeah, no, definitely uh, not a coincidence from my perspective. I think um, just, just to add to what you said in terms of the attack so like you said the muslims are uniting there's these calls that are ramping up even like you said there's western leaders coming out and kind of speaking a bit against france or explaining or trying to defend secularism to an extent but um the the two attacks so firstly obviously the Samuel Paty attack was you know that kind of caused most of it but the, the nice attack as you said the fact that it happened in the cathedral why 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 are when were the Christians doing anything here? If, if this is linked to the cartoons and secularism, how are the Christians praying in the church got anything to do with that? But like you said, there's a me message behind this. This is a message that um, I'm not sure whether you know. When the display of the depiction of the Prophet of Allah, or tempted depiction on the, on the, you know, with Charlie Hebdo, a lot of Christians came out and said, uh, you know, this is blasphemy. And, you know, we, we support the Muslims in here because we don't want... Uh, religious figures to be blasphemed. So yeah, yeah. The, the Christians were supporting the Muslims. But when this happened, what the message shows is, look, these Muslims don't have any care for the Christians, nor the secularists, nor any other belief or atheism. So, you know, what that does is now the Muslims are on one hand and everyone else is on the other. Uh, but then the Vienna attack, what that now does is, it's not just the French that are, uh, um, uh, you know, um, being threatened. It's all, the whole of Europe. It's Vienna. It's, it's Austria. It's Germany. It's the whole of Europe. And that's when all these leaders came out and said, you know, we are standing with Austria. We're standing with France. And don't, I don't know whether you remember. I can't remember. There was an attack previously. I can't remember which attack it was. But they, um, they all came out. All the leaders, the European leaders, came out arm to arm uh, in the streets of Paris, I think. I can't remember. That was now. the, uh, wasn't that the, actually, that was the Charlie Hebdo one. The Charlie Hebdo one, yeah. So what does it show? The, the, we need to be aware of this. We can't just take it in isolation. We need to think about what message are they trying to push um, with these kind of attacks. Like you said, it, it's, it's distracted the Muslims now. It's put the Muslims on the, the defensive, or they've tried to do this. This is their uh, plan, from my perspective. Um, and your question about, is there a track record? There's absolutely a track record of, of them doing this. Uh, many of the attacks, even starting with uh, some, I'm not sure whether you know about Gladio. Operation Gladio was something that... Uh, uh, the NATO, NATO backed, and it started in uh, World War II, established in World War II. And some people call it uh, stay behind organizations where they would try to uh, sabotage the communists by leaving people in the Soviet Union uh, to cause t uh, terrorist attacks or assassinations or things that would happen there that they would blame on the Soviets and cause internal war and justify some of their, uh, their stance. And, and you, I don't know whether you know what Gladio comes from. Gladio comes from the word, I think it's gladius, which means double-edged sword. Double-edged right. sword, what does it mean? Is that you think it's a weapon, but actually it's, it's a double-edged sword, so you're getting cut by it yourself. And this is what it was, it was a secret organization that was exposed uh, afterwards of being, uh, you know, basically carrying out false flag attacks. 
Uh, this then got uh, re um, like it went to the next stage when the when the communists fell. Uh, this then uh, became targeting Muslims, and Muslim attacks would take place, or Muslim terrorist attacks would take place, uh, both in the Muslim world and in Europe, uh, and and the US even, which then they would blame on Muslim terrorists and say, look, this is what they caused, and uh, they they would use this to justify invasion, uh, the war in Iraq, for example. How how many uh, terrorist attacks were taking place between Sunni and Shia before the Iraq War? Zilch, zero. Mm. But since then, uh, after the you know, missionary organisations like Blackwater, uh, they would t undertake these attacks. So there's absolutely a track record of this, and we can't be unaware of this. Uh, you know, of something that they could definitely do with, with the Nice attack and even the Vienna attack. The issue you have sometimes is if you mention this, and even amongst Muslims, they come out with the age old, oh, you know, you're talking conspiracy theory here. You're talking, oh, you know, we don't have evidence that, for example, the person who did the killings in Vienna, you know, wasn't actually a Muslim who was, you know, had issues and then went out and did this. It always puts Muslims on the back foot to go, we need a degree of evidence. But I would always argue with them and say, look, every time one of these attacks takes place, there's too many convenient elements that show us that it is linked to these kind of intelligence agencies. Yeah. It's already coming out quite clearly that the, the Vienna attacker was already known by um, the services, uh, yeah. secret service. Often it's also known that these attackers um, ha have previously been groomed by intelligence agencies or have been yeah. Um, somewhat involved and then let out even though they're a threat to society you know yeah. and, and and also on top of that we did our podcast two months ago before the Samuel Patti um, killing wasn't it so that was under the framework of that that um, Islamic separatism speech that yeah. Macron did again yeah. how convenient at a time when Islam is being attacked and they're trying to clamp down on Islam in France this attack suddenly happens. How yeah. convenient is it that the boycott is somewhat gathering some degree of pace and the, the Nice attack happens and then the Vienna attack happens. And then anybody mm -hmm. who wants to do a degree of digging, if they look into Operation Gladio and they look into Gladio B now, they will see that there's evidence of former people from the CIA, sorry, from the FBI, for example, I think, what, yeah. what was her name again? Edmonds, uh, Cybel Edmonds. And she's saying that, look, there were conversations between the US administration and Al Qaeda. Yeah. There were, you know, ISIS being set up, all of these kinds of things. A lot of people say they're conspiracy theory, but are not willing to go out and actually do some research and realize they're all too convenient and they always fit a political agenda for the West in, as, yeah. Maz, as Maj was saying, for, for the, the West versus Islam. In other words, the war on Islam rather than the war yeah. on terror as they duped the masses and yeah. called. Well, you know, no, stuff, like, uh, stuff like Gladio, where you mentioned, uh, Jackie, this is, is this stuff that's, you know, accessible to wider community? Is, it, is, this, is this like factual information? Yeah, to be fair, initially it was a secret. So this is a whole, it's a secret, clandestine, what they call it, you know, it's private. They didn't want it to come out. But um, when, after, so the way it came out is the Italian Prime Minister found out that this was happening. Uh, because obviously Italy was linked to the Cold War as well. So when they found out there's, you know, these uh, organizations causing these attacks, uh, they they tried to kind of blow the whistle on some of it. Um, but, um, you know, they, 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 sorry, one minute, um, my screensaver just came on. So they, they tried to blow the whistle on it. But um, it, what happened is it kind of they've called for an investigation and the deep state as we have it, we know there's a deep state across the, the Western world. Mm. They kind of just pushed it aside. Pushed it aside, right? So it's out in the open. It's not. It's not a. It's not a. Uh, what you. What you. It's what you'd call a. An open secret. Everyone knows about it. Um, yeah. But the thing. The main point is, you know, as Rash is saying, there's there's the people who will call it conspiracy theory, right? But my problem with this is that there's a difference between conspiracy and conspiracy theory. The conspiracy okay. theory is something that you've got no evidence for. You just make a claim. Uh, least amount of evidence. You just make some random claim and you say this is what's happening. That's a conspiracy theory, fine, you don't have any evidence for it. 
a conspiracy is different. A conspiracy is when it's something that's happening in the background uh, where they're trying to uh, secretly or privately trying to do something and conspire against the Muslims or conspire against a, a certain people. That's totally different. And I think uh, we need to move away from this view that everything we hear in the media is the truth. We need to dig around a bit, a bit, a bit you know, ourselves. And just this example of the Nice attack here. Let's say it was a real attack, not, not a false flag, it's real, right? Let's just say it is. Yeah? Explain this, right? Why is it that they called it a beheading when it wasn't a beheading? It wasn't a beheading. Was it, not? It, wasn't, it wasn't a decapitation. Oh, it wasn't. Right, yeah. that, that came out after it wasn't, right? Secondly, why is it that this me makes absolute media attention? There's a hysteria all over the media. Whereas when the two women got stabbed in Eiffel near the Eiffel Tower, mm. it didn't. So what I'm saying is, let's just take the premise that it's not a false flag. Then we have to absolutely say that they utilize these to the maximum effect mm. as a bare minimum, right? So, you know, and, and as I've, I'm not going to repeat, Rasha said some of the clear reasons why they've done this, and it's tried, they've tried to distract the Muslims. But what I would say is, have they succeeded? Muslims are still, yeah, they may have calmed down a little bit, but Muslims haven't, by and large, got too defensive. Uh, they're, they're still calling for boycott, they're still protesting. And inshallah, I think that's the message. We, we need to carry on and, and be a bit more politically aware and not allow these things to distract us. If anybody wants to do some reading, back in the 1970s, there was quite a lot of research done on this term called terror management theory. Yeah, so terror management theory is kind of a way to, it's like a psychological thing, bringing the fear of death into the general public so that yeah. you can more easily control what their decisions are. So what you do is you almost put up like a bogeyman to convince people that Islam is your enemy and we're even if we have to spend the money that you need need to feed your children we need to spend that money on fighting this enemy and then people when you um, scare them with death in other words someone's going to blow themselves up and kill you if you scare someone to death you're willing to give up the, what is most beloved to you like you know your wealth and your way of life mm -hmm. in order to protect yourself yeah. So when they yeah. did studies into like terror management theory, they realized that if we do this kind of thing, we can increase popularity of certain people. So even after 9-11, as we know, George Bush's um, thing, went, his support went up because yeah. they saw, that, OK, now we, they, there's a common enemy now. And regardless of all the um, deficiencies in the way of, you know, local policies, foreign policy becomes more important now. And that was the reason they were willing to obviously go into another war as well, because at the time there was no appetite for another foreign war because people were suffering from economic problems. So this whole idea of terror management theory and how conveniently it's used all across the globe, since you mentioned Gladio being obviously when the Soviets originally was the enemy, now Islam is the enemy and how and they're using the same theory to make sure they can keep their population subdued. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. subhanAllah. I mean just 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 think about what you guys are saying and uh, you know what it goes goes to show is that the information is out there. Obviously, you know, you're talking about Gladio and stuff like it's and sometimes it's easy for Muslims and I think most of the time why some do it because I think already without them realizing it, they're already on the defensive. So, mm -hmm. so when they say, "Ah, oh, well, this is just conspiracy theory," the reality is is that no, it's true. It's a fact, but you need to do some research. And and what this shows really is that uh, as Muslims, we need to be uh, clued up. We need to be clued up, and you know, uh, we need to be politically aware as Muslims, as an Ummah. Um, and and the thing is, is because what tends to happen is that if we act purely on emotions, then even though, you know, our intention is sound, okay, no one doubts anyone's intention, but the thing is, then it's easy to get tricked, it's easy to get duped, it's easy for those sincere efforts to be diverted from the path that would actually bring about any real change to something else, right? And, and I think that's something as, as an ummah we need to do, but also at the same time, not just political awareness, our viewpoint in life, this comes from having knowledge of Islam, 
you know, how are we, how as Muslims should we respond to Summa? You're only going to be able to do this or know this if you have that knowledge. And, you know, if you look at the issue to do with the, the, the cartoons, the recent cartoons, right, we see that Muslims are enraged, rightly so. Yeah, we are as well, okay? Um, and reason why is because as Muslims, we love our messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? We love him uh, more than ourselves. Or, you know, we, as a Muslim, this aqidah issue, we, sh we have to love the messenger more than ourselves, our parents, and, and everything, um, except, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? But isn't it worth then just, just questioning that this love that we say that we have for the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that even this love, without knowledge, without knowing the life of the messenger, without knowing his struggle, without knowing what he struggled, what you know, without knowing why he was stoned at Taif, why his feet, his 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 feet were stuck to his slippers with the blood, why, yeah. why was he doing these things? Without knowing all of this, without knowing his life, his mission, then this love, it's a bit. You know, it's, it's, I'm not saying people don't love uh, the messenger. Of course they do. But, you know, maybe a lot of that love has been, uh, you know, inbuilt in us through our upbringing, through our culture, through our family, right? But our actions don't really uh, show this. So, I mean, even the issue, I mean, what I'm trying to throw out here is that, you know, what does it mean to love the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? You know, uh, is it enough just to respond when some cartoons happen? But be busy with your day-to-day -day life when when the kufar are not so blatant if you know what i mean so so yeah. just just turn that out i i totally agree i think um like we've already said uh, as you said th there is a positive sign with the boycotting and the protests and, and and we can see there's an emotional attachment of the ummah towards the love of the prophet and you know you could argue even those who are not practicing yeah when it comes to the issue of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they're there to defend because they know they know they may not even practice. They might not even be praying five times a day. I'm, I'm sure many do, but even those they will they will show that they love the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is a really really positive sign. However, my like I said, my advice, and as you're saying, is to love somebody. We need to know that person, and I think there's a saying of Imam Shafi as well that if if you you know if you're sincere in your love for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you would obey the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Subhanallah. So, to obey the Prophet, you need to know the Prophet. So this we as I think Rash was saying to transform this emotional attachment, which is good. It's, it's amazing that we're there. Because might let's take the other argument. Say say it wasn't there at all and we didn't care. That's that's far worse. You know, if someone yeah. was was not bothered. The fact that we're bothered, alhamdulillah, that's a really good sign. The next step really is now, in order to truly love the Prophet, to make this reaction permanent let's learn about it. let's understand what he did what his mission was and uh, follow his example as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, and in the messenger وسلم, you have the best of examples and I don't know whether you guys know do you, do you know when this was revealed in what circumstance no so as I was reading about yesterday this the, the, when it was revealed was it's actually uh, in the surah al-ahzab which is oh, to do with the war of the Confederates, the, the trench. Uh, yeah, the trench, where there was a coalition between Quraysh and all the other enemies. Mm. Um, and they came and basically uh, tried to unite against the Muslims, even the Jews, I think, as well. And basically, uh, the, in the previous verses before this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there are hypocrites amongst the Muslims who are telling them not to go to war, that, you know, they're, they're basically stopping them, right? And that if they did fight, that only a few of them would have uh, fought just out of their pride. They wouldn't do it for the love of Allah or the love of the Messenger. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't listen to them. Listen to me. In the, best, uh, in the Messenger, وسلم, you have the best of examples. Follow him. And, and then the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, uh, I'm going to paraphrase now, which is not great, is it? But basically, that when the, the believers saw the enemies coming forward, they said, this is what Allah and his messenger promised us. Mm. I mean, they didn't fear the fact that the enemies had consolidated and came and to attack the Muslims. They didn't run away. They didn't fear. And it, it brings our example to life, that here we are shouting and uh, boycotting and protesting against the world. 
it's the Muslims against the entire world because the most of the world is in support of secularism and, and freedom. But don't fear because we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on our side. We have Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa on our side. And this is what Allah promised us. We will face tests. We will face uh, the enemies coming against us and uh, form a, co a coalition against us. As they've, as they've done, they've come and supported each other and said that they're with, they're with France. All these quotes you mentioned, right? Uh, but let's not fear. Let's keep united, uh, keep pushing for this, but also pick up the seal. And I'm going to do a quick plug as well. Uh, you know, I've got a series podcast on, on, on Talking D or the Talking Zero podcast. And this is exactly what we try to do here. You know, demonstrate the, you know, try and uh, provide the message of the seerah and what the, mes the messenger Ali wasalam did, but also give that practical example. How do we apply it to our life today? And inshallah, there's been a few episodes, but um, we'll carry on. Do one, and I do advise uh, it's all available, it's free. No one needs to pay for it. It's there, and inshallah, we can we can take this as a as a step uh, to go and learn more about our beloved. You know, a lot of what we see today with the boy boycotting and the protests and things is basically an emotion of love. And like you said, that's important. That's a step in the right direction. But we need to turn that into a love that facilitates the right actions. Yeah. Um, and I'll do what I always do. I'm going to call out some of the, the people of knowledge, the scholars. And, and Maj knows I've got a habit of doing this. But what it is, <laughs> is really, as an ummah, the people who should be steering us are those people in knowledge, with knowledge. They should be the scholars. They should be the ulama, the people who should be guiding us towards the right action. If they guide us towards boycotting and protesting, okay, that might show us how we do, you know, how we show solidarity and we stand in, you know, shoulder to shoulder against these blasphemous cartoons. But if you're going to do that as ulama, you need to go one step further. You need to actually tell us what it, the actions we need to carry out to prevent these things in the, in the future, not just reactively when they happen. Yeah. So I've been listening to khutbah and talks and stuff of kind of prominent scholars recently. I'm not even going to mention names. I'm sure if you look around, you can find them. But sadly, several of them, when they talk about France and this French attacks and, you know, the, the caricatures of the Prophet ﷺ, when they talk about this, they highlight they highlight the situation of the Prophet ﷺ in Masjid. Mm. Yeah. Again, maybe JK, you can add as well, but they highlight mm. his situation in Mecca and say, look, the Quraysh were attacking him. You know, they were calling him names. Mm. They, you know, they were killing other Muslims and torturing them. And look, the Prophet ﷺ didn't go around chopping people's heads off and didn't react in mm. a, a physical way. Yeah, so they'll use that bit of the example and they'll say, look, you almost, to an extent, need to turn the other cheek mm -hmm. or to an extent you don't react in a violent physical way. And they'll give some good advice and say, obviously, you can't go out and do kind of vigilante um, justice. Yeah? yeah, but what they won't do, and this is what's really sad, they all know the seerah. They won't tell us that, what initially was happening in Makkah was the Prophet ﷺ was preparing the Muslims so that mm. when the state was born in Medina, he went back and then he dealt with those people who were attacking him, were attacking the Muslims. Yeah. Muslim. So to tell the Ummah that, oh, turn the other cheek, to tell the Ummah that, okay, you can't react you know, physically, to keep that in isolation and then not tell them what the Prophet ﷺ was actually working for and yeah. the solution that actually solves this problem. That's, yeah. in my opinion, if it's intentional, that's, that's deceptive towards the Ummah and that's misguiding the Ummah when you're in a yeah. position of responsibility rather than guiding them. And that's where I think, you know, we should yeah. call them out. Firstly, we should educate ourselves because we should know that, but then we should call out these ulama and say, look, you should be guiding us and showing us how to act. When you tell us to boycott, fine, you're telling us to do an action, but don't tell us to boycott as if that's the solution, because it's not. Exactly. No, do you know what? It's, I think you make a great point there that I've, I've heard this as well, where, um, yeah, there may be some, they're very knowledgeable, no doubt, and they, they, they will give us some real good things. I'm not, I'm not saying we don't listen to anything they say, but 
when it comes to the solution, when it comes to the mission of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I think they fall, fall far short. So this example you gave here, where they use uh, isolated instances in Mecca uh, to justify the fact that we you know turn the other cheek. Um, two reasons really, it's wholly wrong. Firstly, even in Mecca, uh, there was an incident. Let me give you an example. There's an incident. Um, all of you will know this. Uh, where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was praying in, uh, near the Kaaba. And when he went into sujood, uh, there's the worst of them, the worst of the Quraysh, the most uh, crude and the most uh, vicious against the Muslims was this man called Uqba ibn Abi Mawit. He was the worst, like he was the most crass and what he would do was no more, even Abu Jahl wouldn't do to, to what the extent he did. Uh, but what he decided to do, two, two instances, one instance, he. Uh, decided to take on the challenge of Abu Jahal and took the intestines of a, a camel that was slaughtered and placed it on top of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he was praying, right? And this, you know, this, imagine, this disgusting. And his daughter, Fatima, who was a child at the time, was the one who saw what happened and, and had to take off this from her father's back. And, you know, imagine this, this is trauma. This, this is akin to what the Palestinian children see of their own parents in, in Palestine, for example. But probably worse. That was one incident. The, another incident, the same man, Uqba ibn Abu Mawit, may Allah's curse be upon him, he um, tried to strangle the Prophet while he was praying, literally with his shawl, he was trying to try to strangle him. And after this incident, um, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi he, he got up and he made dua against them and he named them. You know, he named the, the names, he named Umayyah ibn Khalaf, he named Uqba ibn Mawit, Abu Jahab, all of these, he named them, right? And you know how they ended? They all died in the battle of Badr. They were all, all of them, they were all perished, right? So did he turn the other cheek? Absolutely, he didn't turn the other cheek. He was angered by physical attack, mockery against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mockery against himself and, and the Muslims. He didn't attack. And then the second point, as you said, did, did he just sit around and do nothing and carry on with uh, living his life in Mecca? No, he was on a mission. He was, uh, you know, making sure that the message of Islam was uh, being spread to the believers, that he was co creating this core base uh, where we would have security and protection. And that was achieved in Medina. And then in Medina, when we had that political entity, and we had a military and we had that uh, protection, then these people were dealt with. So if, if I know that, I'm sure these scholars know that, no doubt. They, you know, some of these scholars have some great CR series as well, but when it comes to the practical application of it, when we face a dilemma or, or uh, you know, these cases that we have now, you'd, you'd, you'd want them to at least give justice to the seerah, give justice to the mission of the messengers of Allah from, from my perspective. So yeah, I think what it is also, the, the points you guys make, I think, you know, obviously we have in this discussion, uh, Muslims want to do boycott and demonstration stuff because of this attack on our beloved messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the reality is, is that, you know, uh, blasph blasphemy is something which, you know, is being going on for a long time. Okay, obviously it's something which is totally unacceptable. But the reality is, is for, for many a time, you know, uh, the, if, if you look at even the time of the Crusaders, you know, they, they, they used to call the Muslims Mohammedans because they thought that the Muslims worshipped uh, the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa and he was somehow, you know, depicted as like a, in a devil form and stuff. But the reality is, is that yes, the emotions there, but I think if we can, if Muslims as Muslims, if we can connect back to the seerah, if we can connect back to what the life of the messenger, the mission of the messenger وسلم, is about, then blasphemy, put that to the side. The reality is, is that at this moment in time, the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absent from this world. Okay. And I feel that the Europeans, they know um, they are well aware from their history about the, the struggle they had with the, the Muslims, whether it's the Ottomans or whether it was the uh, the, uh, the Umayyads who um, reached almost near Paris at the Battle of Tours, right? So sometimes for me, the way I see it is that, you know, yes, at times they're doing it maybe for strategic, uh, strategic reasons, but also maybe at times they're doing it just to humiliate Muslims. To, yeah. to humiliate Islam because they can, because they have the power. And that's what it boils down to, that as Muslims, we don't have the power today. And, and blasphemy is one thing, you know, uh, just the fact that Islam is not being implemented. 
just the fact that Muslims are dying, uh, you know, for no reasons whatsoever in the, in the land, Muslims are starving, there's illiteracy. All of these issues that we can think of, these are down to the fact that the solution that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us on how to live our life, we can't apply those solutions without the system which he's also given us, that, that divine system on how to implement these, these solutions so we can you know, uh, apply them on the problems that we experience in life. And I think that's something which is really important um, as Muslims. It's not just a case of getting, getting emotional or getting angry because our beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa is being insulted. But if he wasn't being insulted, look at the situation today anyway. You understand? You know, this is just, all they're doing is they're trying to humiliate us further. They've got us down. You know, and, they, and they just, you know, they've got their neck, their foot on our necks. And all they do now really is rubbing in the salt, in, in the wounds. And this is what they're doing. But, but the fact that we're on the floor, the fact that we have an open wound, that's the issue here. It's not the fact that they're rubbing uh, salt in it. That's the problem. Why are we in this situation where these people have the audacity to uh, project images of, uh, of what they think anyway, of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on state buildings? This is a declaration of war from my point of view. Right, mm -hmm. but as Muslims, we can't respond, and the reason why we can't respond is, you know, we're not united. And and another point I just want to add as well is that, you know, uh, to to deal with this, to deal with the problem, there needs to be a united vision on a what the problem is and what the solution is. So what we're seeing is that Muslims are coming out, the emotions there, but just mm -hmm. think about it: why is Sheikh Hasina allowing? half a million people to come out and demonstrate but if the half a million people came out and said we want sharia in this country do you think she'd allow that so what you're seeing is that we have this emotion there but without a sincere leadership without a sincere leadership to 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 direct the muslims on how to on how to actually um, implement struggle which is gonna you know you know achieve the objective without this this leadership we're just going in all our own directions and, and nothing is going to happen. And, and just, just a quick example I want to give is look at all this Black Lives Matter, all this George Floyd. We did a podcast on this at the time it happened. We were saying, yo, listen, this is a problem with the system. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to change, right? And think about it. In reality, think about it. Other than some statues coming down, what changed? Nothing changed. What happened was people were emotional for a certain period of time, then everything goes back to normal. You've got to go back to work. You've got to put food back on the table. And that's the mm -hmm. issue. Because as the Muslims, we're up against state actors who have the, who have, you know, the facilities, who have you know, uh, the capability to direct us in any way they wish. And until we're not politically aware, until we're not really, we don't have a, a united vision for Islam, for the Muslims, then the problem is, is that um, activities which, yeah, in, in, in and themselves may be good because they show some sort of like, uh, you know, uh, rejection of what they're trying to do. Give it another couple of months, you know, we'll be drinking Evian water. You know, Russia will be using L'Oreal uh, cream on his, uh, on his face. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you know, it's reality. I've been there, man. It's happen it happens. It's a, it's a cycle, mm -hmm. isn't it? But... But, you know, to sort of like bring this to a close and, and get your final thoughts um, on this, because I think that uh, it's important. We've, we've explained a lot of things. We've explained that the Muslims are responding, which is positive. But at the same time, you know, uh, you guys have explained the fact that if we don't connect to Islam, if we don't make our love for the Messenger, وسلم, not just an emotional one, but also an intellectual one, then... Mm -hmm you know, we're not really going to be able to get to where we need to in this way. So, I mean, what, what are your final thoughts anyway, on, the, on the podcast, guys? I'll start with Rush. Okay, so a few, a few quick ones, really. So first and foremost, it's important to understand the, the context around things like protests. And you can apply this to um, boycotting as well. So when people, and you gave a good example already of it, where if people are going to protest for, say, Allah's deen to be implemented, then obviously that's a protest that you should support. So to, to blanket and say protests don't achieve anything, you've got to be a bit careful about that. The fact that mm. Muslims are coming together 
uniting on something that is an Akida matter is a, a good step in the right direction. But the reason why I mention it is when people are calling to protest and lobby governments, governments who are causing problems, we need to be careful that those type of protests, all they do is sap the energy of the masses of the Muslims. So we should always look at every action that's being done and have a look at what the objective that is trying to achieve and then review that action. So I think that is important. And you've already mentioned the boycotting side. Let's look at what is it trying to achieve. And if we're going to do it, do it long term, but also do those actions that are going to solve the problem, not just something that is just nipping away at some of the symptoms. Yeah. yeah. Um, secondly, you know, we say we're, 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 we're devastated by them doing some of these actions against our prophets and the mm -hmm. Lord. But we should also be devastated by the Muslims and the blood that is being spilt around the world in Muslim countries and otherwise, where our Ummah is suffering. All of those things should unite us, not just mm. when they attack our beloved messenger. Yeah. So, yes, we emotionally react and then we want to do something, but we become desensitized to the blood of our, our brothers and sisters. So it should all unite us. Let's not just react to one thing just because it's happening at this particular time and just because the media or the scholars and the ulama might be mentioning it, all of a sudden we react to it. And then the rest of the time, we're quiet getting on with our lives. So I would say that would be a message to myself first because it happens to all of us. We see something trending on social media, suddenly we get agitated. Suddenly we want to write a post about it. Suddenly we want to go on Twitter about it. All of a sudden, something's happening with the yuga muslims that's been done to death now and therefore we just go oh it's just you know we can't do anything you know we ourselves get affected by social media and mm. and that's people who you know we're involved in the dawah we get affected by it so the the person who maybe isn't as active against you know the enemies of islam how are they going to react obviously the media dictates our emotions so i think we need to unplug ourselves from that system don't let the media dictate our emotions let the situation on the ground make us reflect and then work towards a correct solution and then my last point is goes full circle to the beginning when we're talking about um, the u.s elections and things like that look at secularism and look at democracy that is what they're trying to package and put mm. into our lands that's what they want us to adopt they want us to say democracy in our lands. They want secularism in our lands. We wholeheartedly reject these. We want Islam in our lands. So now that we can see at face value how hypocritical secularism is, how decaying as a way of choosing your solutions democracy is and how flawed it is, now should be the time we stand up and go, wait there, we don't want those those are firstly they're not from our deen secondly look how flawed they are and we want what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has has asked us to have and those and that in itself will be the thing that solves the root cause rather than just tackle some of the symptoms so those yeah. would be a few messages to myself first and to those people who are listening yeah, yeah, I think to be fair, Rash has made most of the, the, the key points that I think we should take away. But just, just to a, a short point, really, uh, just building on what Rash said, um, we do need to ask ourselves, all of us as, as Muslims, I think, like, like I said, it's a, it's a clear benefit, it's a clear positive reaction of the Muslims uh, when the messengers of Allah have been attacked. And because of, as I said, this has come from the backdrop of uh, Macron's comments about Islam in crisis. So that, that is a clear positive, right? But I think the question we should ask ourselves is, what are we trying to achieve? And this goes back to Rasha's point about objective. What, what are we trying to achieve? If we are merely trying to achieve a, a clear message to the world that we're against this, I think we've probably much achieved that. Because that, if it's as short term as that, we've achieved that. We've done some boycotting or we've done some, uh, we've done, uh, some protests. That's clear. Everyone knows that this has caused a reaction of the Muslims. But if... But the, the, the thing we should really be trying to achieve is the vision of Islam. And what is the vision of Islam? It's the vision of the Messenger وسلم, for Islam to be dominant, for Islam to have that protection and the Muslims to have that authority. I think that if we have that clear objective in mind, then 
yes, we can get involved with protests and, and boycotts with that vision in mind and, and recognize that, yes, these are things that have happened and we're reacting to it, but actually they're all symptoms to that one very key problem of the absence of Islam uh, and the absence of a, of, of a protection. And I think I'm not going to repeat it, but I think in your last podcast or the podcast previously, you spoke about the fact that when the Muslims were came across some a situation like this in the past, when we did have an authority, there was a clear state reaction by Abdul Hamid when the French wanted to do this play and the British, uh, you know, wanted to do this play. There was a clear, uh, clear message that uh, he would send his army, and, and they they were felt threatened and they stopped. So, this is what we want to achieve, and the only way to achieve that is by questioning our representatives, so-called representatives. Uh, and having a leadership that does represent us and protects our interests, whether it be the you know, dishonor of the messengers of Islam, or as Rashid is saying, anything that goes against Islam, because there's an attack against Islam and an attack against the Sunnah that's occurring, and we should be uh, equally aggrieved at some of this as we are with the Prophet ﷺ. So that's really my message and my final points. So it's Zakhlaha to, to both you guys really, uh... I mean, you've made the final points, to be honest with you. The only thing I would say is a message first and foremost for myself and to everyone else out there as a, as a call to action would be to to really um, uh, make learning our deen a, a priority, to understand our deen. Um, and if we do this, then we would not be on the defensive no longer. We would actually be on the offensive. And we would see that the people that we're up against, they have nothing. They have falsehood you know you look at when the Macron made the comment about mm. Islam is in crisis right and there was a big issue to do with secularism and Islam okay that's fine Islam is in crisis let's sit down let's have a let's have a debate let's have a discussion let's see what's in crisis but look look what level these people are that what they what they do they they went and uh, you know showed some cartoons and the reason why they did that is because they can't have an intellectual discussion. For them, mm. they just want to do something, a shallow action, but what they knew would hurt Muslims, right? And this is what they did. So as Muslims, if we can understand our deen and understand that uh, you know, what the, our, our mission is, i.e. the same as the, as the, the mission of the Messenger, وسلم, then we'll mm. see that all these actions, whether it's Macron or whether it's you know, uh, Trump before or whoever, all these actions, they're not isolated. And like, uh, like President Erdogan, he made a comment in regards to uh, you know, the, what the French and the Europeans are doing. And he said that it is like they want to start the Crusades again. So you know, he's seen it from an, a, a, an ideological, from a historical point of view. We can't forget, it's, okay, yeah, you know, most of us were taught that Henry had six wives, but look, there's more to history than that. You, know, you need to do your own digging around. You, have, you have to understand your own Islamic history. And when we do, then we'll see that yes, they are make, they are, they are you know blaspheming or they are making these cartoons, but this is nothing compared to what they have done in the past and actually what they're mm. doing today. So why is it that we respond to one thing, but not to the the the, the, the other option, the other thing which is probably mm. worse? Uh, but I want to leave you on that note, inshallah, guys. Really, jazakallah uh, for mm. all your contribution. Uh, and I hope that the, the listeners and, and those watching this podcast will benefit from this. And, uh, you know, um, if, if anyone has any comments and stuff like that, they want to add to it, then surely in the comments fields, you're, you're able to do so. Um, and at this moment, I'd also, uh, you know, encourage everyone to subscribe to the Voice of the Ummah uh, YouTube page and the Facebook page. Um, you know, we're on Instagram also. And also, and uh, I know JK did a plug-in earlier, but we do have Talking Sira podcast as well. And uh, and, and Talking Sira is exactly is, is is there to do exactly what we're talking about, is bringing the life of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, back into our lives and make it a reality, so that we can apply it to our current mm -hmm. issues that we face. And that's the point of the Sira, not uh, not being read as a storybook. But guys, inshallah, jazakallah um, uh, for your contribution and uh, for all those listening and watching Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Thanks for watching that video For more exclusive videos please like, share and subscribe to our channel 
Don't forget you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.